Well, good morning, <clears throat> or perhaps good afternoon. <laughs> it's pretty clear the President served in the Senate and not in the House of Representatives, because, of course, in the House we have the five-minute rule. <laughs> but I want to thank all of you and, and Arthur for uh, allowing me to come spend some time here with you this morning. It's good to be back at AEI, where we have many friends. Lynn, of course, is a longtime scholar here, and I'm looking forward to spending more time here myself as a trustee. My eight years as Vice President were quite a journey my, during a time of big events and great decisions. Being the first Vice President who had also served as Secretary of Defense, naturally my duties tended towards national security. I focused on those challenges day to day, mostly free from the usual political distractions. I had the advantage of being a vice president content with my responsibilities. I had, and going about my work uh, with no higher ambition. Today I'm an even freer man. Your kind invitation brings me here as a private citizen, a career in politics behind me, no elections to win or lose, and no favor to seek. The responsibilities we carried belong to others now. Although I'm not here to speak for George W. Bush, I am certain that no one wishes the current administration more success in defending the country than we do. We understand the complexities of national security decisions. We understand the pressures that confront a president and his advisors. Above all, we know what is at stake. And through administrations, and, all, and though administrations and policies have changed, the stakes for America have not changed. Right now, there's considerable debate in this city about the measures our administration took to defend Ameri the American people. Today, I want to set forth the strategic thinking behind our policies. I do so as one who was there every day of the Bush administration, who supported the policies when they were made, and without hesitation, would do so again in the same circumstances. When President Obama makes wise decisions, as I believe he has done in some respects on Afghanistan and in reversing his plan to release incendiary photos, he deserves our support. And when he faults or mischaracterizes the national security decisions we made in the Bush years, he deserves an answer. The point is not to look backward. Now and for years to come, a lot rides on our President's understanding of the security policies that preceded him. And whatever choices he makes concerning the defense of the country, those choices should not be based on slogans and campaign rhetoric, but on a truthful telling of history. Our administration always faced its share of criticism. From some quarters, it was always intense. That was especially so in the later years of our term, when the dangers were as serious as ever, but the sense of general alarm after September 11th was a fading memory. Part of our responsibility, as we saw it, was not to forget the terrible harm that had been done to America, and not to let 9-11 become the prelude to something much bigger and far worse. That attack itself was, of course, course the most devastating strike in a series of terrorist plots carried out against America at home and abroad. In 1993, terrorists bombed the World Trade Center, hoping to bring down the towers from a blast down below. The attacks continued in 1995 <clears throat> with the bombing of U.S. facilities in Riyadh, the killing of servicemen at Kobar Towers in 96, the attack on our embassies in East Africa in 1998, the murder of American sailors on the USS Cole in 2000, and then, of course, the hijackings of 9-11 and all the grief and the loss that we suffered on that day. 9-11 caused everyone to take a serious second look at threats that had been gathering for a while, and enemies whose plans were getting bolder and more sophisticated. Throughout the 90s, America has responded to these attacks, if at all, on an ad hoc basis. The first attack on the World Trade Center was treated as a law enforcement problem, with everything handled after the fact. Arrest, indictments, convictions, prison sentences, case closed. That's how it seemed from a law enforcement perspective. But for the terrorists, the case was not closed. For them, it was another offensive strike in their ongoing war against the United States. It turned their minds to even harder strikes and higher casualties. 
9-11 made necessary a shift of policy aimed at a clear strategic threat, what the Congress called an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. From that moment forward, instead of merely preparing to round up the suspects and count the victims after the next attack, we were determined to prevent attacks in the first place. We could count on almost universal support back then because everyone understood the environment we were in. We'd just been hit by a foreign enemy, leaving 3,000 Americans dead, more than we lost at Pearl Harbor. In Manhattan, we were staring at 16 acres of ashes. The Pentagon took a direct hit, and the Capitol or the White House were spared only by the Americans on Flight 93, who died bravely and defiantly. Everyone expected to follow on attack, and it was our job to stop it. We didn't know what was coming next, but everything we did know in that autumn of 2001 looked bad. This was the world in which al-Qaeda was seeking nuclear technology, and AQ Khan was selling nuclear technology on the black market. We had the anthrax attack from an unknown source. We had the training camps in Afghanistan and dictators like Saddam Hussein with known ties to Mideast terrorists. These are just a few of the problems we had on our hands, and foremost on our minds was the prospect of the very worst coming to pass, a 9-11 with weapons of mass destruction. For me, one of the defining experiences was the morning of 9-11 itself. As you might recall, I was in my office in the West Wing in that first hour when radar caught sight of an airliner heading toward the White House at 500 miles per hour. That was Flight 77, the one that ended up hitting the Pentagon. With the plane still inbound, Secret Service agents came into my office and said we had to leave now. A few moments later, I found myself in a fortified White House command post somewhere down below. There in the bunker came the reports and the images that so many Americans remember from that day. Word of the crash in Pennsylvania, the final phone calls from hijacked planes, the final horror for those who jumped to their death to escape being burned alive. In the years since, I've heard occasional speculation that I'm a different man after 9-11. I wouldn't say that, but I'll freely admit that watching a coordinated, devastating attack on our country from an underground bunker at the White House can affect how you view your responsibilities. To make certain our nation never again faced such a day of horror, we developed a comprehensive strategy beginning with a far greater homeland security effort to make the United States a tougher target. But since wars cannot be won on the defensive, we moved decisively against the terrorists in their hideouts and sanctuaries and committed to using every asset to take down their networks. We decided as well to confront the regimes that sponsored terrorists and to go after those who provide sanctuary, funding, and weapons to the enemies of the United States. We turned special attention to regimes that had the capacity to build weapons of mass destruction and might transfer such weapons to the terrorist. We did all of these things and, with bipartisan support, put all of these policies in place. It has resulted in serious blows against enemy operations, the takedown of the AQ Khan network, and the dismantling of Libya's nuclear program. It required the commitment of many thousands of troops in two theaters of war, with high points and some low points in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and at every turn, the people of our military carried the heaviest burden. Well over seven years into the effort, one thing we know is that the enemy has spent most of his time on the defensive, and every attempt to strike inside the United States has failed. So we're left to draw one of two conclusions, and here's the great dividing line in our current debate over national security. You can look at the facts and conclude that the comprehensive strategy has worked and therefore needs to be continued as vigilantly as ever. Or you can look at the same set of facts and conclude that 9-11 was a one-off event, coordinated, devastating, but also unique and not sufficient to justify a sustained wartime effort. Whichever conclusion you arrive at, it will shape your entire view of the last seven years and of the policies necessary to protect America in the years to come. 
the key to any strategy is intelligence and skilled professionals able to get that information in time to use it. In seeking to guard this nation against the threat of catastrophic violence, our administration gave intelligence officers the tools and the lawful authority they needed to gain vital information. We did not invent that authority. It's drawn from Article II of the Constitution, and it was given specificity by Congress after 9-11 in a joint resolution authorizing all necessary and appropriate force to protect the American people. 